Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Stephen Gillen Crime Files. My next guest has a fascinating story. It could be said that if his story was put in front of a Hollywood scriptwriter as a first draft, it would be dismissed as unbelievable, really. You know, we're talking about someone who was black ops, really, you know, was in between the CIA and the FBI for many years undercover in the mafia, the Italian mafia, and later to go on to um, into the Russian mafia and be aligned with some unbelievable figures of the day. But the plot doesn't stop there. It thickens greatly with this next unbelievable guest because his father was actually a made man and a carpo in the mafia. And he grew up amongst this life. This is an unbelievable reveal, guys. Coming next. So look, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to the to, to more modern times. Now I know you know a lot of ex mobsters who've come out of the other. You know some big big names have reached out to you. Um, uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, very very current. Of course, he was the underboss of John Gotti Senior, involved in Boston, Paul Castellano, and you know the the. Uh, uh, the the decline and the end of the Gambino family, certainly, of that time. What happened with Sammy Gravano? Well, what happened with Sammy, Sammy took the rap for his kids. I know his attorney, Tom Farinella, very well. He's a friend of mine, his attorney. And he took the rap for his kids. His kids got involved in the drugs. And as a result, he took the rap. For he didn't want to, you know, which a father would do. And so that's where he got involved. But the thing is, let's face it, he killed 23 people. How do I, how do I feel about, you don't kill, I mean, uh, to kill 23 people and then, you know, get it be free, it's hard for me. And has he, and has he reached out to, I mean, he reached out to you, I mean, these guys do, don't they? For well, him. yeah, they did, yeah, he did uh, through his attorney, but uh, I wasn't able to do it. I couldn't do it. Let's talk about another name, uh, John Gotti, John Gotti Jr. Right, you know, I mean, yeah. tell us about uh, your your dealings with uh, John Gotti Jr. One of his associates reached out to me, and we met on a couple of occasions, and uh, he wanted me to help, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. That's that for me, you know. I mean, even if I could, it's that's something I would do. What did he ask you to do, Ron? Can you tell us? He, a bit well, about that? at that time, he was going through his problems with John A. Light, you know, and uh, as a result, they wanted me to go after A. Light. You know, I don't know John A. Light. I'd never met him. I mean, we, we've heard of each other, but I've never met him, and uh, I don't know anything about him. And, and uh, you know, they wanted me to go after him, and I just, how am I going to go after him? I don't know anything about the guy. So you know, you know, when John Gotti Jr. was, you know, or through whoever was saying, go after John A. Light. Well, they wanted me to help bring him down because he was saying things that may or may not have been true. I don't know the answer to that. So it became a problem for me. If I'm not going to do something if I don't, you know, have no knowledge of it. And um, the, the, the things I could say was I knew Joe Pioneer Moan. No one's going to stand up to Joe Piney or Moan and tell him not to do something. Nobody. Joe Piney was a respected man. I wouldn't dare think of that. So I've interviewed John John A. Light, and, um, you know, I know you've been on a documentary where yeah. you know, we're doing some work. You know, we're privileged enough to be doing some work with you, Ronald, and other people. On another documentary you've done, Mr. Undercover has to be said, excellent, excellent work. Oh, thank you. Uh, John A. Light's on there. I mean, uh, you don't know John A. Light. Have you ever met uh, John ever? No, never met him. Never talked to him. So what do you, 
what do you think about about this kind of beef between these two guys you know between john gotti and you know and this uh and john a line do you think is there any, what do you think about it Ron? what's your I think, I think what you're running into are various egos on both sides you run into egos and when you know, one says you're lying and the other says it's a he said, she said type of attitude. You know, and if I don't know, I you know, I'll inject myself up to, with the truth if I know something. But if I don't know it, how am I going to respond either or, you know, either way? I can't do that. How do I do that? I never did that, you know. In other words, I'll be fabricated and I don't want to start something like that. And to guys, you know, I mean, I know in your unbelievable journey, you know, you're 70 now, Ron. Oh, yeah, I'm 75 years old. I'm an old timer, but I'm still working as a private detective. Congratulations, by the way. It's been a long, it's been a long journey, and you're still here, really. Yeah, Not really. You know, um, congratulations. So, look, in your present day, you're still going. You know, you're still, you know, you're still there. Do people still reach out to you, Ronald? Yeah. What kind of people yeah. are we talking about? Your law enforcement. I still do pro bono work for the FBI. Pro bono means for free for the FBI, and I do some for other uh, police agencies. In fact, I just took uh, just a couple weeks ago. I ended up had, pulling a child molester off the streets. We, with, we had children with them. We were going after a, a client of mine said his wife was going with this guy. And I checked his background and found out he was convicted uh, 10 years or the last year of uh, child uh, pedophilia and, 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 and molesting. And he was sentenced to 10 years and given a suspended sentence. Well, I, what I, would, I did is I put a legal GPS on the vehicle. And as a result, I found out where they were going in the hotel room and that the children would sleep with both of them three or five year old and a, I think a 12 year old. And I had the Williamsburg police come in be on a capious warrant. In other words, it was a warrant for his arrest. And we pulled him off the streets. He's in jail now. He handled them, he handed them a forged ID and he was an illegal, I mean, he was, he, he was an illegal immigrant that came here. And I don't like the word it today. You know, I still use the word illegal because it's a violation of the law. And, he came here and uh, from El Salvador, and he was supposed to be in uh, the reason they had the Cape is he never showed up for probation for over a year. And now it, we got him off the street. So things happen. I'm glad to get that makes me feel good that I was able to get somebody off that was a child molester. Ronald, it has to be said that your, your story is supremely unique, you know, to many other mob stories as it were you know it's it's really it's really unique in the sense your father was a you know made man carpo you was born into that life you lived that life he was a mob associate undercover for you know 17 years you know he then went on to work for the you know contracted to the cia the fbi you've been to russia you know you've you know you've you've yeah worked on the Russian Russian mafia. You have seen many sides of the coin, as it were. Now, where you are now, so seasoned in your journey, what do you think about organized crime and mafia now as a whole? It's a cancer. It's a cancer that's still there, and it's not going to stop. As long as the public is willing to put up with our own uh, – wants we want more we want this we want that we want better for ourselves instead of thinking of each other you're always going to have that that's a way of life is it i don't i don't see how you can stop it if you you if you want what your neighbor has because you don't have it that's how it goes and they're going to make sure you get it it's like the drug business that's out of control worldwide you're, you're you're heading toward an implosion on this this planet we see it happening and i don't see a solution to it america's at uh, it's it's gone i mean you're going to see a, a, some sort of revolution here one way or another 
that we're going we're to have to pick up the pieces. It's like what Einstein said. You know, they asked him how World War III would be fought. He says he doesn't know, but it, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And, I mean, he was so correct. So, you know, mafia, people would say, it goes right the way back to the old country. Some would argue, hey, you know, it was there when the conquerors come on. Come on, Sicily, we had to look after our own, so we protected our own. And, yeah. you know, and it comes from these roots and all that stuff. So, is it, you know, and it's honorable and it, uh, men of honor and all this. So, is there anything good? Is there anything? Well, that the validity of what happened early on is correct. They were looking after their own. And that's where it came from. And when the Americans, when the Italians came to America, the police were all British or Irish, and they had their problems. So they had to organize their own groups. As a result, that was their protection. Later on, of course, it got out of control. It's like anything else. You let something fester for too long. It's one thing. Once you've reached your goal, then stop it. But it doesn't work that way. It continues. And that's how it happened. And then, they, you know, you had the rise of the gangs, and it's like the Jewish mafia, uh, Irish, you know, gangs, things like that. Get, maybe not as uh, secretive and clandestine. Well, the Irish, the Jewish mafia has been the most clandestine. And I always said, remember how uh, the Cosa Nostra would bow their heads to the Jewish mafia. They were the ones that were really the dominant factor in the background. Yeah. This is going back to the days of the Black Hand. Even yeah, before. yeah, it was always good. Yeah. So here's a question. Here's a question, and you're definitely the man to ask it. Of all the uh, all the great guests I've had the privilege to interview, what do you say to the people then, Ronald, to say, well, hey, yeah, you know, I get it about these mobsters, organized crime, and all this stuff they're doing, but to me, in my life, where I am, I think the government are corrupt. I think politicians, I don't trust them, and I think they're bigger crooks. What, what do we say? What's the answer to these people? What's the truth there? They're all crooks. I can't, <laughs> I can't decipher. I mean, I just seen so much corruption that I, that I don't know if there's an answer anymore. Corruption seems to rule. I've seen it in politics all my life. I don't care if it's Democrat, Republican in this country, or I've seen it in elsewhere. Uh, Canada, you, I mean, I, I can go on and on in countries. We have our problems. As long as mankind doesn't learn how to learn to live with each other. And I'm not talking through some uh, socialistic banner or, you know, it's like the Bolsheviks. They took, took over Russia. They were the smallest group of all of them. But they had the loudest voice. And they made sure they controlled the media centers. Once you control the media centers, once you, you start screaming and putting your place, people in the right time, they'll overcome the tibet uh, individuals that are out there. And, and that's how it operates. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing it elsewhere. We're, it's going through the world right now. 